On an unsuspecting stretch of road in the Ural Mountains, signs line the highway with an ominous message. Drive at max speed for the next 20 to 30 kilometers. Do not stop. Signs like these are the harsh reality of a radioactive wasteland created by the world's worst enemy, us. Uh, when most people think of the Cold War, two words spring to mind, nukes and secrecy. And secrecy, well, that's the theme of today's episode. Of the significant nuclear events that have occurred since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, none have flown as quietly under the radar as the Kishtim disaster of 1957. For those of you who are not nuclear enthusiasts or Russophiles, the Kishtim disaster was a major nuclear incident that occurred in the former USSR and was kept secret from the world until the 1990s. With those secrets unlocked, it's time for the world to understand the Kishtim disaster, its effects, and the devastating aftermath. In 1948, the Soviet government constructed a nuclear facility they named Mayak. The facility was built to produce plutonium and recycle nuclear waste in the formerly closed city of Chelyabinsk-40, now Ozyorsk, in the Chelyabinsk Oblast, Russian SFSR, Soviet Union. It was given the codename Kishtim to correspond with the closest town on the map. In addition to the production and recycling areas, the facility included an 8.2 meter or 27 feet deep concrete canyon containing 20 stainless steel tanks for storing radioactive waste. Before the plant introduced the storage tanks, the workers at Kishtim callously dumped radioactive waste into the Techa River. This was unfortunate for the facility's neighbors because that particular river was the primary source of water for 20 neighboring towns. After years of dumping nuclear waste into waterways, the facility's workers probably realized that polluting their drinking water wasn't the smartest of moves. With an out-of-sight, out-of-mind attitude, the plant workers switched up their waste management routine, opting to store the radioactive waste away in the concrete canyon for safekeeping. Out-of-mind was a pretty common theme of the old Soviet bloc, but as we're about to learn, this way of thinking wasn't always beneficial to the Russian people or contribution to a stable ecosystem. Kishtim was an accident waiting to happen. As previously mentioned, Kishtim doubled as a recycling facility and was equipped with a special concrete canyon used to house 20 stainless steel containment tanks capable of storing radioactive waste. On Sunday, September 29th, 1957, at 4.20 p.m., containment tank number 14 exploded, causing damage to containment tanks 7 and 13. The explosion hurled 70 to 80 tons of toxic waste out into the soil and nearby lakes, and the blast was so strong that it blew a one-meter-thick concrete lid straight off of the containment tank. Over the next 10 hours, about 800 tons of radioactive particles were subsequently deposited by a strong wind over an area that stretched 300 square miles, which is only about 60 square miles smaller in area than what happened in Hiroshima. It was eventually revealed that the Kishtim disaster was caused by a failure to repair a malfunctioning cooling system in containment tank number 14, which caused a chemical explosion. In basic terms, the tank was not getting the cold water it needed to keep its contents stable. Despite knowing the problem, workers at the plant allowed the temperature of the tank's contents to reach a temperature of 660 Fahrenheit or 350 Celsius. The workers at Kishtim had known about the issue with the cooling system for a year, but nothing was done to fix the tank. The day after the incident, a crew arrived at the facility to assess the damage and devise a plan to contain the fallout and keep the incident a secret. Now, it comes as no surprise that the Soviets were champions when it came to a good old-fashioned cover-up. In true Soviet fashion, the government spin doctors quickly moved to prevent any information about the disaster from getting out by accentuating their two best qualities. And subterfuge, and boy, did it start spreading quickly. The local newspaper ran a story explaining that the aurora borealis caused the yellow-orange skies above the area of the incident. Now, obviously no one bought the official line, but no one dared to challenge the narrative until many years later when a legend of a man did, but we'll come back to him. Furthering their efforts to cover up the explosion, the area surrounding the plot went into lockdown and plans to hide the evidence were swift. Food in the area was checked for radiation and destroyed before being replaced with foodstuffs that were brought in by train and truck. The first evacuation started a week after the incident and continued sporadically over the next 50 years. Now, you may be confused as to why the government would carry out sporadic evacuations, so let's take a little detour to explain why. The Russian government spent many years monitoring the radiation levels in the area surrounding the Kishtim facility. During high radiation levels, residents were moved out of the area and returned when the levels were safe. 
Eventually, the residents were encouraged to return to their homes, believing the area was safe again, but that was a lie. As part of the cover-up, the Russians locked down the disaster zone in 1968 by turning the contaminated area into a nature reserve. The primary purpose of closing the area off was to minimize exposure, and the second purpose was to study the long-term effects of radiation on the ecosystem. Decontamination of the facility began in 1957, with 38,500 individuals, including children, taking part in the effort, working in 30-minute shifts to minimize exposure to radiation. The main buildings were operational approximately three months after the explosion, leaving the workers to clean up the rest of the grounds, finally completing their effort in 1959. The storage canyon's ventilation, cooling, and monitoring systems were restored safely by the drilling of special boreholes in which tubes for the water supply and temperature monitoring sensors were installed. After the drilling was complete, the holes were covered with a protective layer of uncontaminated soil, measuring 1.5 meters thick to reduce further contamination of the area, but this was still not enough to mitigate the destruction caused by the explosion. The nuclear fallout caused utter devastation to the region, leaving vast sections of land unfit for farming and putting many out of work. Restoration of the farmland started in 1961, and it took nearly 30 years to regain 87,000 hectares of contaminated land for agricultural purposes. That is about 83% of the initial contaminated area. Slowly but surely, the region stabilized, farming resumed, and families rebuilt their lives. But they were still living under a veil of secrecy, with many questions left unanswered. The Russians kept the disaster at Kishtim a secret for nearly 40 years. For 40 years, the residents of the area wondered why babies were no longer being born in droves. They wondered why the few babies who were born weren't strong and healthy. But most of all, they wondered why everyone they knew was dying. Of all the people who wondered, one man set out to do more than that. That man's name is Gosman Kabarov, and he dedicated decades of his life to proving that the Russian government deliberately exposed his town to radiation and covered it up. Gosman was born six months after the Kishtim explosion and grew up a mere 40 miles downriver from the facility. Gosman always knew there was something strange about his village, but no one ever seemed to want to talk about the cancer, enlarged hearts, or the disproportionate number of deaths that seemed to plague their village. Whenever the children asked questions, they were met oh, with a cold retort. We don't ask questions. It wasn't until 1991 that government officials came to Gosmanstown to admit what had happened. With this revelation, Gosman started to piece together the tragic moments of his life and that of his neighbors. With a Geiger counter in hand, Gosman spent the next 10 years measuring radiation levels in the region in an attempt to link the illnesses and deaths suffered in his village with the disaster at Kishtim all those years ago. Gosman's first problem uh, was proving the link between the Kishtim incident and the health problems suffered by the people of his town. Besides having the burden of proving the source of the illness, the Gosman had the added headache of dealing with the government's reluctance to admit the severity of the disaster or that they used the people of the area as an experiment, so getting compensation or even acknowledgement of the mistake was going to prove difficult. To prepare for the battle ahead, Gosman formed the watchdog group Tekka in 1996. Together with his wife, Milia, they started collecting as much information as they could to document the illnesses and deaths suffered in their region. With a mound of evidence in hand, Gosman and his wife started to appeal to any governmental organization uh, they thought might help. Melia appealed to the Ministry of Health for help and spent countless hours documenting the birth defects, miscarriages, and stillbirths they suspected were caused by exposure to radiation from the plant. Unsurprisingly, the government ignored the couple's efforts, but not before putting Gosman on a government watch list, labeling him as an enemy of the state, and placing him under surveillance for good measure. Being placed on a government watch list was of little concern to Gosman, though. In fact, being labeled as an enemy of the state only encouraged him to fight harder to force the government to reveal the truth. When the government eventually realized that Gosman would not give up on his quest for justice, they made the most ironic suggestion ever. The Russian government invited other countries to send their nuclear waste for processing at the Kishtim facility. The intent of the offer was for the government to set aside a portion of the profits to fund a compensation scheme for the affected residents. Now, obviously, this announcement was not well received and resulted in a campaign to petition for a referendum to stop the import of radioactive waste. The petition received well over the two million required signatures needed to force a referendum, but the government rejected it due to too many invalid entries. After the petition was validated, the total number of signatures was reduced to 1.9 million. Convenient. After nearly 20 years and countless fights with the government, compensation was finally offered to the disaster victims. As part of the settlement, the residents were given two choices. A million rubles, the equivalent of about 30,000 US dollars, or a new house. 
In 2006, a million rubles would have easily bought you a new apartment far away from the radiation, so it's easy to see why many of the residents took the cash option. The rehashed evacuations were packaged as a resettlement program that spanned six years from 2006 to 2012. The resettlement program was largely considered unsuccessful due in part to the low acceptance of new housing by the victims. Most of the residents who took the cash offer never saw the full amount. As for the ones who took the offer of a new house, they were moved a mere two kilometers up the road to live in a new settlement that was still well within the contamination zone. In extending their efforts, the government compensated the residents who chose to stay in the contamination zone by paying them benefits of 1,320 rubles, the equivalent of about $15.30 a month to offset the cost of living in an irradiated area. And it's very important to note that this was in addition to the 172 rubles, or about two US dollars a month, the residents already received as a stipend for living in that irradiated zone. Now, when considering those folks who decided to stay in the village, many of you will probably be thinking, why would anyone stay in a place that is making them sick? Well, it was Gosman who summed up the situation poignantly by highlighting the fact that the residents of the area live in an economic prison. If they leave, they lose their right to compensation for living in an irradiated area, as well as the medical care and other benefits that come with it. Simply put, the victims of Kishtim had no choice but to stay, and that is the cost of secrecy. Rumors about a nuclear incident at Kishtim had swirled for years, with many accusations made and refuted. The accusations were eventually founded, and the Soviet Union collapsed and the Russians finally opened up about the incident. Now, admitting responsibility for the incident isn't strictly true, because it was a clerical blunder that exposed the truth. The Russians knowingly put information about the explosion at Kishtim in a report that was presented at a United Nations inquest into the accident at Chernobyl. Despite trying to deny the filing blunder, the Russians eventually owned up to the disaster while simultaneously downplaying the severity of the event. According to news reports at the time, the Russian government claimed that the Kishtim accident only released a small fraction of the total amount of radiation released by the accident at Chernobyl, and it was nothing to worry about. Plant officials further doubled down, insisting that the accident caused neither harm nor death. In 1993, the Russian government exposed a little more of the truth by reporting that about 450,000 people were exposed to harmful levels of radiation because of the incident at the Kishtim facility. In 1994, as a measure of atonement, the Russian government put the Kishtim facility in the nearby town on the map and changed the name of the closed city from Chelyubinsk 40 to Ozorsk. The rest of the world's response to Kishtim and Chernobyl was swift, and they started by instituting better methods for measuring and monitoring nuclear disasters. In 1990, the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, established the International Nuclear and Radiological Event Scale, or INES. The INES is a level system used to measure radioactive incidents that has seven levels, with seven being the worst. This supposed minor incident at the Kishtim facility was retroactively categorized as a level six incident. In the years after the disaster, strange illnesses began to affect the residents. Because of exposure to dangerous levels of radiation, the government encouraged citizens to go for medical checkups, but it didn't tell them why. As soon as a few of the residents realized the checkups were connected to radiation exposure, word spread and many of them stopped going to the doctor. It is unclear why the residents stopped going, but many speculate it was out of fear of losing compensation should their conditions improve. Regardless of the town folk's reluctance to see a doctor, the effects of that fateful day in 1957 carried on through the generations, wreaking havoc on the population and causing some of the most horrific illnesses and conditions that you've ever seen. One resident of the area, Nadezhia Kudapova, gave birth to a child with six fingers on one hand, and another of her children had major respiratory issues. Giving birth to a child with major health problems is tragic on its own, but to add insult to injury, several of her family members worked at the plant, knew what happened, and kept that information from her. Sadly, she wasn't alone in her trauma and heartache, because many of her fellow citizens were desperate to have children, even sick ones. In the years after the fallout, many couples found it difficult to conceive, and the increased risk of miscarriages or stillbirths was a genuine fear for the women of the region. Those who were lucky enough to carry their pregnancies to term found themselves caring for sickly children burdened by medical bills. Gosman and his wife were desperate for a child, but unfortunately, they were both rendered sterile because of the incident to Kishtim. The same fate befell Gosman's mother and several other residents of the villages. The revelation of his infertility was a massive blow to Gosman because he came from many generations of large families and wanted to continue the tradition. Gosman's own mother also found herself with fertility problems after the explosion, but not before giving birth to 11 children. 
Gosman received recognition for doing right by others when he received the International Soros Award for his services to activism, and he continues to champion for environmental protection and accountability to this day. Despite the unforgiving nature of the area, many of the people affected by the explosion continue to live there and are trying their best to live as normal a life as possible in the shadow of a facility that robbed them of their dignity, while hoping that they never see another disaster at the facility on this scale or worse ever again.